So we'll introduce sociocracy for all, and uh, we'll do a sort of a very brief introduction of sociocracy, and then we'll turn it over to Rakesh so that he can talk to us about this perfect complementary edge between sociocracy and permaculture. Uh, so Rakesh will tell us, uh, will give us some of his philosophical thinking, some stories perhaps, and then we will, uh, Jennifer and I may ask him some questions, and then we'll open it up to all of you to ask questions. Um, and that's the plan. What is sociocracy? No one ignored. How can we build an organization where nobody is ignored? Um, so the question is, how do we do that? So if we look a little more deeply, what um, is being done is that if we have a transparent organization, then everybody will have equal access to information. Um, everything will become more effective and equivalent and all of that will happen in the service of the organization's aim. So we want to do something and the values that are driving how we do it are transparency, effectiveness and equivalence to the aim of reaching our overall aim of nobody ignored. That for us is what sociocracy is about. And sociocracy really focuses on three different um, different uh, areas. One is the organizational structure. How do we build an organizational structure where nobody can be ignored? One aspect of that is that we have circles where people know each other, small work groups that are really um, have authority over what they're doing. And we can have like a fractal structure um, go more and more deeply into smaller sub-circles that are doing their thing. And you can do that endlessly if you want. But the point is that the power for those in the power in those circles is actually at the most uh, specific level. So every it's not that the the highest circle, so to speak, makes the decisions for the lower circles. It is the other way around. It's bottom up. The small circles make decisions for their own domain, and the rest is more about flow of information. So the arrows here are showing distributing power into those small circles. And then, as I said, flow of information is what we call the general circle in the middle. One um, tool to ensure that nobody can be ignored is that we linked, link those circles by what we call a double link. So two people, and that's what you can see here, exemplified by two um, purple people. These two purple people would be part of both the, the center circle, that is for flow of information, and this circle. And that way, there is no feminist, there's just us in both, both ways. Us as the general circle, us as the, that particular department circle. The other um, area is how we make decisions. Again, no one ignored is what we want to do, but we also want to do it in an effective way. So, different from consensus we're shooting for consent that means every a decision is made when there's no objection which means we don't all have to get what we want we just have to make sure that everybody who has a real objection says i cannot work with this will be heard and the other thing that is very important to us is continuous learning so and that brings us very close to permaculture and that topic. Um, here's the, the terminology that we use in sociocracy is lead to measure. We make a plan, we try it out, and we see what happened. Um, I want to give, so that we can get that sort of over with, also give you brief um, information about who we are. Um, Jerry and I, I'm Jennifer Rao, by the way. You can rename us as both of us. Um, we are sociocracy for all. We have a bunch of volunteers that work with us, but we are the two um, staff. What we do is we make videos. For instance, this recording is one of the videos, but we also make some particular like, um, specific teaching videos. And here you can see some of them. Um, and the main video that um, is, is what we want everybody to start with when they're looking for sociocracy, this is the four minute video. Um, that we offer and we have it in all kinds of subtitles that volunteers have translated translated for us. So that's the video aspect of things. Then we also, I've lagged on here between my computer and the, there, there you go. 
Um, articles and resources. We write a lot of articles on social media. We're also about to publish a book. Um, we also offer what we call the um, study group curriculum, Empowered Learning School, where you can just get a group of people together and watch training videos that have exercises in them, and you can do that wherever you are. This is totally decentralized. We do our immersion training and, of course, in-person workshops. We also help with implementation. We have work circles for members who stick around and um, become our volunteer people. And that's what we do. Complete. Is there anything I should have said? Uh, no. A little measure yeah. here? No. no? Okay. So as we, um, as we did our training programs and we need people, um, and we have got some colleagues who have who are involved with permaculture design and so we started hearing oh i took i learned sociocracy from rakesh oh i learned sociocracy from rakesh oh rakesh is involved with here and there so well okay who is this guy we need to talk to him and find out who he is and and you know and that's how we got here inviting him to speak with us uh, rakesh uh, i guess is i don't know if you were born and live in theory in the uk but a citizen of the world um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with, with that, I think I'll just turn it over uh, to you, Rakesh, and you can start us off however you wish. So, yeah, so my, my background is I was, as you rightly say, born in the UK, in London. And, um, yeah, but uh, probably for the last 20 years, I've hardly spent any time here. I'm here right now with my record collection behind me. It's the only reason I come back is I can listen to some of my, my music. Um, but yeah, seriously, I, I spend most of my time, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the Balkans, in Croatia in particular, where we started our, our first eco village, uh, which is kind of where I discovered uh, permaculture in a rather roundabout way. And so far as I started going to the eco villages to, you know, with a view to setting up my own and everyone kept telling me, wow, I should be teaching the stuff that I know, which was quite bizarre given that I'd never lived in an eco village before. Uh, so eventually I bought some permaculture teachers over and at the end of the, the course, the students basically said, wow, we learned as much from you as we did from the teachers and the teachers basically said wow you should be teaching this because for me permaculture is just common sense and my phrase is um and you can quote me on this is permaculture is just common sense in a world where sense is no longer common simple as that so um you know as i say everything i've done in my life which uh, you know i started off from a, a very poor family worked very hard Got you know, basically walked out of school at the age of 12 mentally. Uh, so didn't get an education, could barely read and write. I'm totally dyslexic and struggle to read and write well. Um, but I learnt everything myself. I learnt by doing things, by working things out, by seeing it, trying it, touching it, smelling it, feeling it, trying it, testing it. If it didn't work, fixing it, changing it. So I very much learn by example rather than theory. Um, and so by the time I started uh, coming across permaculture, as I say, by, when I did the course, more or less everything they had to say in the course, I'd already figured out in some way or another through all the different things I'd done in my life. Uh, as I say, as a, in my background, uh, as a computer consultant, uh, because computers are just so logical, so obvious, so easy. Uh, so I went for the big one. I started studying and or rather working with Unix systems, making fault tolerant computer systems. So working on systems for thousands of people all logged on at the same time. And my specialist area was making sure that uh, those machines were available 24 seven, meaning that when hardware failed, the system never went down. So understanding complexity and simplifying it is something that's very easy to me because of my pattern thinking because of this dyslexia that I have and so that whether that goes for you can apply it to either computers in which I did initially but you can also apply that to nature which is how and why I could understand how natural systems work and uh, um, function by understanding patterns first and then going into detail when I need 
those detail. And the same goes for human dynamics. So in, um, yes, the other parts of my, my life, I, once I earned enough money, I started to, um, you know, got myself out of poverty. Um, I then started to try and give something back. So I started studying things like yoga, massage, and what have you, which eventually led me to studying homeopathics. So I started doing disaster relief work as a homeopath. And that again, got me out of the world and got me to some really, you know, to war zones and earthquakes and cyclones and all kinds of different places where I really got to see people and human dynamics, you know, the struggles that some people have. So again, that got me to understand uh, certain things about how people work. Um, and then eventually, as I moved to Croatia, where we started this eco village, um, and we realized that you know, creating, uh, growing food is easy. Building houses, no problem. Making, um, I don't know, electricity, simple. Earning enough money, no problem. And so basically the two of us who started it, we basically made a mind map of all the things we wanted to do, how we were going to do it, and came back together and they were absolutely identical in all those areas that I just explained. And the one place that both of us had a huge big black hole, big empty space, was people, dealing with conflicts. And uh, we looked at ourselves and, and sure enough, that was our Achilles heel. That, that was the very thing that uh, basically stopped this amazing, beautiful dream that we had from uh, fulfilling itself. So luckily I moved back to England just at the time that Transition Brixton was kicking off and totally engaged myself in everything that is um, to do with uh, social. So I learned Dragon Dreaming, I learned Six Thinking Hats and everyone kept telling me about this, oh my God, you've got to hear about this sociocracy. It's oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, great, what is it? And everyone's like, blah, 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 blah. What? Oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. Huh? And people, you could see they were so excited, but no one could actually explain what it was or what it does. So for years and years and years, I kept trying starting projects using Dragon Dreaming and Six Thinking Hats and all these other great tools and the same challenges, i.e. people's egos, vested interests, and all those kind of things kept stopping each project or that was if a project failed it was because of because of those things but people kept telling me about sociocracy and but I just didn't get it until one person then I was doing a I was teaching a eco village design education course in Denmark and one person came along who said he would do a little talk on sociocracy and in a 10 minute talk 10 minute personal conversation he just explained consent decision making set against a vision a collaboratively created vision mission and aim that's all i needed from that bang everything fell into place i worked out sociocracy there and then just in that 10 minutes um so basically yeah my background is with uh, permaculture because permaculture is just common sense and i i'm gifted to have common sense um and because of all my social, uh, all the different types of work that I was doing in, you know, in grassroots organizations, uh, I saw lots of projects fail. And so I really had this, uh, and because of my systems thinking, I could see where everything was failing, but I had no tools to fix it until I found sociocracy. So what is permaculture? I mean, most of you have said already you've studied some permaculture, so I probably don't need to go into much detail. All I'll say is that, you know, the, for me, the real strength of sociocracy is how it's a way of thinking. It's a way of looking and observing and understanding the world, breaking it down um, and understanding how systems work, especially how nature works and how is it that you can create the maximum amount of strength and resilience and uh, abundance in whatever system it is you're designing by working with the patterns of nature i understanding the system that you're trying to create understanding what is the succession process of each system i.e where is it if left on its own where 
what is the progression where is it that it would like to go to so where does nature want to go to where does a, a community want to go to in what direction does it want to move if you understand the succession process understand how and at which point in succession does it really find this uh, balance this equilibrium that gives you the maximum benefit as well as nature and everyone else around you and everyone else who want to somehow as an edge uh, into that system where is that point that you want to get to and then finding the most simplest tools to help speed that succession process up all of which is underpinned by ethics um, all of which is supported by uh, principles and patterns so it's you know if you've got a um, a very logical or a very creative or a very systematic mind it doesn't matter you can work your way within permaculture to to be able to understand the world to see how you can tweak it some of the the limitations from what i've seen of permaculture throughout the world is that while many people are really great at building houses growing food uh making the great water treatment systems and the you know the whatever uh, what do they call them herb spirals and and various little techniques and things it may be really good at the tangible side of permaculture but quite often which is why i was really smiling when i heard quite a few of you had studied some kind of social permaculture that's really beautiful to hear but i find generally a lot of permaculture projects are quite lacking in their social skills and how they take care of themselves let alone how they take care of each other, of their neighbours, of their friends, of their competitors, if there is such a thing in a permaculture world. Um, you know, other people, other teachers, other farms, other people who are trying to do things. There's this, uh, quite often this tension. And uh, that really worried me because that's not how I work. That's not what I, that's not how I want to, to see projects unfold so that's why i was always looking for as i say as i explained in my my personal background of my first eco village the um the it was the social element that we realized was our achilles heel it was the one thing that we could realize was not was going to stop us from really fulfilling our project and so that's why i started looking for these tools when I eventually found sociocracy, as we know, it's, you know, um, it's really clear for me as to how it works in terms of, um, you know, making sure that everyone who comes into a project is fully aware of what it is you want to achieve. So you, if you're beginning with the project with sociocracy, an ideal scenario, then when you start the project, you have absolutely ensure that everyone is involved in co-creating the vision. Now, um, obviously that's not always so easy if you've just already started a project. So in that case, you then need to uh, start saying, okay, where we use sociocracy is the place where all of us can consent to what vision it is we want to create. So, uh, for example, um, okay, I was in one country working with a uh, a vegan uh, a vegan community, or not a community, but a a society. So, you know, so it wasn't a co-housing thing. It was just people from all over the the town coming to these vegan meetings, and they're telling me about how much tension there is, how there's always infighting between people. So I started off by trying to find out, well, why is everyone there? You know, and some people were vegan because of, because, you know, uh, animal rights, some people because of health, some people because of the environmental impact, some people because of, uh, I mean, all real extremes, you know, some people were there because they absolutely hate human beings. Humans are so awful and so terrible towards animals and oh, we should kill all animals, all people. Ah, you know, everyone is really at a very, and some people weren't even vegan. I said, oh, yeah, we heard about this. We thought we'd, we'd kind of check it out and see uh, maybe we might want to be vegan at some point. So pretty much every single person out of the 40 people were there 
were there for very, very different reasons. So when it came to making decisions, you know, so for example, there was at that particular moment, there was something happening in the local zoo of how they were treating elephants in a country where elephants really shouldn't be. And so they, you know, so one activist was like, oh yeah, we've got to go down and, you know, uh, don't worry, just bring your bother boots. You know, if the police start kicking you, kick them back and all this kind of thing. And, uh, and half the people are like, no, we don't want to, why, why would we want to go and get you know, beaten up by the police? And uh, no, we're not interested. We're just, just interested because of health reasons. So when they were making decisions, they were making decisions against, uh, against what? against no predefined idea. So it's obvious as to why they couldn't agree. Yeah. And so, so it took a while, but we kind of came to some idea as to, okay, when you as a group are together, you make decisions based on this vision. If anyone wants to do something outside of that scope, you have a separate meeting. No one, no problem. We still love you. You're still part of our community but you make a decision in another subgroup that aspires to a different vision. But when you're in this group, you make decisions based on this common vision and this common goal. So yeah, so while it's, it's obviously it's very easy to start a project using sociocracy, it's, it's a lot more difficult to kind of get uh, sociocracy up and running in an existing group. I also work with businesses so we do uh, various things uh, again in a, in a kind of similar way where we work with the wherever the passion is so rather than trying to implement it in the entire company we work with the parts where where it really works so, or where it really wants to happen so getting back to to permaculture which is the main thing as I say what i notice is a lot of uh, permaculture groups don't necessarily have the skills and the tools well they do have the tools but they don't necessarily always use them in terms of how to uh, really get the social side of things working well. So for me, sociocracy works because it's very logical. Um, more or less every permaculture project has some kind of you know, commonality behind it. And if anything, we can just say that's the ethics. You know, we, we understand and we aspire to living a life which adheres to the permaculture ethics, you know, earth care, people care, fair share. So whatever it is we do, we base it against, is it going to genuinely enrich the world or is it going to destroy the world? Am I taking advantage of it or am I genuinely making it a cleaner, richer, happier, safer, more vibrant place? The same questions we can ask for people. You know, people care. Are we enriching other people's lives in whatever it is we're trying to design, whatever it is we're trying to do? Are we genuinely going to enrich other people's lives or are we exploiting them, destroying them, depleting them? Are we depriving people of their ability to thrive in this world by doing whatever we're doing? You know, so you can ask those same questions and so obviously you're constantly looking all right, so maybe I am actually creating a livelihood that is enriching other people's lives. But you can still use those ethics to say, well, what could I do to make it even better? How can I enrich even more people's lives? And this is what permaculture design is. Uh, and so to try and make some of those decisions um, and to try and get people together to work together to aspire to, to meet that high level of, of vision, um, I find sociocracy works incredibly well because it's logical, because it's systematic, because it's flexible. You know, like permaculture, permaculture is not a set of uh, techniques, which um, I see some people, uh, especially YouTube permaculturists, kind of try to, you know, to label permaculture as just, you know, it's the, yeah, this raised bed, that's my permaculture garden. This, uh, you know, all these different techniques, that's not permaculture. Permaculture is a way of thinking. It's a way of understanding and enriching the world. So, and because of that, it's very, very flexible. And that's what, you know, sociocracy has built within it. It has this ability to try something out, test it. If it works, carry on. Can we make it better? No, we can't. Let's carry on then. 
can we make it better? Yes, we can. Is it working? No, it's not. Okay, let's change it then. So this constantly checking, this constant feedback mechanism, trying things out, testing it out. All right, well, let's try it like that. Well, that didn't work so well. All right, let's go back to the old version again. Constantly trying and testing, which is exactly what nature does, which is exactly what, you know, really good, rich, uh, stable systems do. They keep, when things don't work, change. Be flexible. So this whole idea of, you know, um, of having like a vision, you know, I, I go to many companies and see lots of different grassroots organizations. Yeah, 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 we've got a vision. Yeah, what is it then? Oh, hold on, let me just go and find it. Um, oh, it should be here somewhere. Um, oi, John, where, where did we uh, put, is this, isn't it in this folder? No one, no one knows what the vision is. It's not alive. So how on earth can you say, okay, you've got a vision, but it's not alive. So how do you know you're working towards it? So at the beginning of each and every one of my meetings, the first thing we do is we quote the vision and the mission at very least, maybe not the aims, but the vision and mission and say, does that still make you excited? Is that still like, wow, yeah, great. Yeah, I want to do this. Um, so we check in. This is why we are here. This is why we are together. So if you're still excited by this, let's carry on. If you're not excited by it, all right, next meeting. Who, who else is not excited? All right, you guys, recreate the vision. Do something. Change the vision. If this isn't exciting to you, what's going to make it exciting for you to carry on uh, working together in this group? And this complete flexibility to even change the, the whole vision that you're starting with is what makes so shocks you really exciting. So, so yeah, so some of the projects um, that I've kind of started as, as may have been alluded to before is um, the children in permaculture project. So again, this came, this children in permaculture project came out of, uh, I was part of a European permaculture teachers network where we would meet um, every three, four months somewhere in Europe. And there was one young lady who was constantly talking about, yeah, but what about the children? Yeah, but what about the children? Yeah, but what about the children? And some people got excited, but everyone's like, look, we're all adult educations here. And, um, and so the children's voice was constantly being ignored. A few people come together and they'll try and do something and then it would disappear. The next meeting, a few people come and it would disappear. So I watched her for about two years, trying to get something off the ground. I then uh, ended up teaching a course in Finland where she was living. And while I was in her, her kitchen, I just said, you really want to get this off the ground? Okay, so as long as you do it my way, I'm happy to lead it. And what my way is, is this way. And it's all to do with sociocracy. It's all about transparency. It's all about collaboration. It's all about, um, you know, not having any leaders, but having people who clearly facilitate processes. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to kick this process off and we'll start by, and I start all my projects the same way now. I start the project by having, uh, by first of all, having a core group of two, three people. Um, well, sorry, three to five people maximum who kind of throw out some ideas and get a vision together. Uh, this is mainly a sanity check that, you know, I know I've, I've got a million ideas, but is this one actually going to get it off the ground? And you know, is this kind of idea sane? If there's four or five of us who believe it's sane, okay, so let's get some kind of vision together. We then get that to the rest of the world and say, hey, who else is interested in this? Who else resonates with this vision? The next thing we do when we get those people together is we completely drop that vision. The only reason for that initial vision was to bring people to our table. We drop the vision, we re completely recreate the vision with the people who are in front of us. Right, what's your vision now? So that we can make it our vision. Forget the vision that I that called you here. That was just to get you here. But what is our vision? What's going to make you excited as an individual and then eventually as a group to continue working together? So then once we get that vision together, I then spend two days teaching sociocracy and creating the whole 
culture around which we work. So as well as creating obviously our vision, mission and aims, etc. Um, the most important thing that I think that I do is we create, as I say, this culture. So we look at all the different areas of what's going to really enrich our lives throughout the duration of this project. What are the things that potentially could stop us from enjoying being here? And let's create some kind of a culture around how we keep checking in and keep enriching each other's lives. And that culture, that policy, that, you know, um, I mean, in a workshop, you'll call it a course culture. Uh, in a project, we call it a project culture. So in a community, you call it your, your community's culture. And for me, that's really an essential part. And that we use, obviously use, we create using sociocracy so that it has its uh, time limit and we keep checking in with it and we keep revising it. Is that working? Is it happening? Is it not happening? You know, are people adhering to it? If they're not adhering to it, why not? What's, what's, what do we need to change in that policy? You know, what's, what's not quite working in that policy? And, and in this way, we really create something special. So nowadays I've started, um, you know, probably for the last, I don't know, three, four, five years or something, started implementing, start, I initially started doing sociocracy as an optional part of the permaculture course. But now from this next workshop that I'm going to start in Holland uh, in a few weeks time, it's actually mandatory. Uh, it's absolutely an essential part because what I found is half the people came, half the people really enjoyed it, really understood it. But, uh, and we created the whole culture, we created everything. Uh, but we really, but in some cases, you know, people struggled to kind of keep, um, you know, to actually understand the whole sociocratic processes because they weren't there at the beginning. And therefore always making those decisions you know, it took a lot longer to really get that flow really happening. We'd always get there, but it would take a lot longer. So now I want to bring sociocracy in right from day one, mandatory as part of the course. And what I find in the permaculture courses is because uh, every day we, or at the end of each day, all the groups have a check-in with each other, or they have, basically I set up small support groups they do various things, mainly about emotional support, about you know um, checking in that they've understood the material, so like a review process. Um, and essentially anything that comes up in that small group that, that needs resolving by the whole group comes to the whole group either later that day or the next morning. So in this way, we keep tweaking the course, tweaking, 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 to make sure that everybody's needs are met and that we use do using this kind of sociocratic uh, consent decision making process. So it really enriches the course. Basically, people not only learn sociocracy in theory, but they get to put it into practice every single day during the workshops. And I find it takes people a while to understand that, but uh, and it takes people a while to recognize that actually they do genuinely have a voice and that their voice is important and their voice is essential and when their voice is heard the group reacts to it and we are all willing to change our ways our behavior in order to meet other people's needs uh, etc etc and that really gives people an amazing amount of, of uh, self-belief and puts the power back into their hands to understand to know that they can really genuinely now start expressing themselves so that they really feel good at the end of the course. So, um, so yeah, so in terms of how it works for running courses, that's quite obvious. And in, in, in this case, basically what I'm doing effectively is I'm creating a community for two weeks. I create a temporary community for two weeks and we use the consent decision-making tools within that temporary community to really make that community rich and alive. Which is why if you ever look at, if you're on my Facebook page and you look, there's, um, there's a folder of some of the feedback that people give. 
you can see how much people really appreciate the attention to detail just that one very simple thing gives people you know just allowing people to look after each other and take care of each other um because for many people they don't have a place where their voice is heard they don't have this power they don't have these opportunities to genuinely honestly express themselves when you give them that opportunity and they take it it really empowers them so you can hear that you can see that in in the feedback so other areas um, where I've um, I've put it into good practice is um, the same businesses but maybe that's not so so important to go into now um, so in design design processes so for example when you're making a design when you have a client um, to be very very clear and get clarity as to what is it what's the vision of the client so understanding their needs being very 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 clear on what your needs are as a permaculture designer um, and seeing how those two come together and the third and probably the more important voice is the voice of nature so what are the needs of nature what are the needs of the animals the plants the air etc etc so when you're creating that vision uh, basically I represent nature so and as far as I'm concerned mother nature is uh, an infinitely more important client than the person who's going to pay me to do a job and if the needs of nature are compromised because the clients needs are not in line with that then I'm not interested in working with that client I don't care how much money they offer me and uh, and I've walked away from several projects several very 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 lucrative projects because they were greenwashing and they were willing to pay me lots of money to do something that was completely against my ethics so I happily walked away from them because mother nature's voice for me is the more, most important voice so when you're working with clients to actually be able to express that in a very very clear way through your vision and your mission for the client to actually be able to express themselves in a very clear way um, for me is what gives again you know using sociocracy to do that is really really powerful now we've, we've got the right starting point now we can carry on designing now we know what we are designing for um, when I do my permaculture design courses the way that I've now evolved it to to, uh, to work is I start the first two day, the first day now is sociocracy the next day as I introduce the permaculture uh, tools and processes and ethics and principles but from the perspective of the individual meaning we first of all start by understanding what are the needs of the each student so each student looks into themselves to understand why am I here what is it that I want from life what is it that I want to learn permaculture for so once they understand and we do some analysis work on their life we get them to analyze um, you know all the things that they do all the things that they need and how they're currently doing it you know how does it filter through uh, the permaculture ethics what's the earth care people care fair share of how you get your food the earth care people care fair share of your housing meeting your housing needs your earth care people care fair share of um, meeting your social needs of meeting your um, your need for self um, I don't know for appreciation for for whatever so we go through all of those so people start to analyze where they're at where are they strong on where are they not so strong on? you know where does it not meet the permaculture ethics and I use a few other tools to also get that nice and clear into focus so now by doing this really simple analysis we can see what is it that we want permaculture to help us out with what are the areas that I want to now learn about to tweak to be able to redesign so that I can actually create the balance that I want 
So having done that, now you're ready for the rest of the course. Now you're ready to learn about soil, water, uh, building houses. Now you're ready to learn about forest garden. Now you're learning to, you know, you're ready to learn about economics, etc., etc. Because you've got a clear vision. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And this is what I'm now going to use permaculture to get me towards. So again, sociocracy and permaculture working really really well hand in hand because each person creates their own vision and mission what is it that's not balanced in their life what is it that they want to do where is it that they want to go to and how is it that we can now start using uh, sociocracy and permaculture to actually meet those needs so the last area maybe that i'll quickly talk about before we open up to questions is um Having done this eco village design education course and, and having taught several of those, I realized that um, there, there's, there's a lot that's, you know, which is a really comprehensive course, uh, but it doesn't necessarily, but from my experience, people talk about doing these things, but they don't live these things. So while they may talk about, you know, the, uh, the importance of not pulling rank, etc., etc. That same person who's teaching that then pulls ranks, pulls rank on the students. They talk about, you know, um, uh, the necessity to hear each other's voice, and then they don't listen to their students. So I've seen this several times in different eco village design courses and, and what have you. And, and I figured, well, actually, I, I, I think a better way to maybe deliver the same content is to actually create a community create a community which uh, and as in the process of creating the community we create the tools and the rules to actually allow that month-long community to really thrive so we start off by teaching sociocracy again sociocracy is the absolute cornerstone of this process and from that we then co-create you know, we understand what the group's vision is. We understand what our own individual vision is within that uh, month long experience. We then start creating a syllabus, a timetable for what it is we want to do um, over the next month. And we continuously, you know, use sociocracy to keep checking. Is this still working for us? Is it happening? Is it? And basically because of this real intensity of connection that people start having um in such an experience you know where people's voices are really heard it really i mean it really brings about the most amazing connection amazing deep connections between people because for most people they very rarely have an experience like this probably the most common comment that people make at the end of this um experience is they say i always thought there's no way I can ever live in a community. Every project that I've done, there's always fighting. There's always, you know, no matter how much you may be the best of friends, mm -hmm. but when you start working together like this, it always leads to problems. But now for the first time in my life, someone has shown me that it is possible to live with each other, to have different opinions, to have different uh, ways of looking at the world to have you know a diversity of thoughts and and what have you but still to be able to coexist. and the thread that pulls all of that together is the ability to express yourself clearly concisely the um and to know that people are genuinely listening and that the people will act on what you say when it's necessary. So there are lots of different processes from the forum, U theory, there's, you know, there's a lot of other great tools for allowing people to express themselves. But ultimately it all comes down to, you know, how you make decisions and how you act on that information. And so giving people that experience for me is really, it's a really magical process. And I can probably talk for the next three hours. So um, so I'm going to stop there, I think.
and uh, yeah, um, maybe answer some questions and yeah, see where we want to go with this. I could have just listened to you for another two hours without. <laughs> um, that was beautiful. Um, I have I have one one comment, and I hope you will elaborate on it. And so you know, from sociocracy trainer to sociocracy trainer, it's always my my interest of like, so where do you see gaps? And you like in sociocracy, you know, like what 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 could we do better? That's that's mm -hmm. that's the frame, and. You partially answered it, and I'm I'm gonna try to paraphrase paraphrase what I heard, and I would love for you to comment on that. So one thing is, sociocracy brings in is a way of bringing in all the voices, right? So that everybody can be heard. One thing that we've come across here and there is the voice of the earth is not being represented because nobody, no person is sitting there bringing that voice, right? And that's why I love when you said, you are the voice of the earth. And the, so I was, I guess, wondering, you know, do you have a process around that? Is it just you, you know, like, how would you, how would you uh, structurally like anchor that or what, or if, if that is too simple, where else do you see gaps around that? So over back to you. Okay, so one of the ways, yeah, me personally, I, uh, it's because our, it's because of how I see the world. When I make a design, when I'm thinking about where I put a plant, I'm not intellectually thinking, where should I put that tree? I am the tree. I'm the tree. Would I be happy here? Do I get all my needs met? Who's gonna take care of me? Who's gonna give me protection while I'm growing? Who's gonna feed me? Where do I get my nutrients from? Where do I, I am the tree. So I see the world through the eyes of nature, first of all, that's me personally. And to bring that to other people, the process I love the most is the council of all beings. I don't know if anyone's ever done that uh, from the whole, uh, wow, where you get people to, you know, spend uh, a few hours getting into character, making masks and thinking about, you know, I don't know if you're fungi or if you're water or if you're air or if you're a particular bird, you spend all this time, you know, getting into character, learning about, and then I the way that I do it is I get people to start having little conversations and I get everyone to meet each other. And it's also an opportunity. And I normally take the role of fungi because fungi also connects almost everything. So as fungi, I go to everybody and I tell them, Oh, wow. You know, I mean, I'm wow. Look at you. You stand there in front of me and you do so much for me. You do this for me. You do that for me. And I really love it when you die oh, and you bring this and you take that and you change. Oh, wow. You're such a, and I exp so even if people don't know, uh, about their particular character, I explain it to them in these kind of pre meetings. And then, um, and then eventually we have the council, which is a very, um, I don't know what the right word is to use. I don't want to use the word somber because it's not exactly somber. It's a, a very serious, we come to a very serious council um, where we as animals, plants, insects, wind, etc., come to meet and talk to each other and just share our joys, but then also share the things that we're not so joyful about. And just this process of people seeing the world through the eyes of an ant, of a, you know, of a mushroom, of a bee, of a drop of water. Just being able to shift that perspective for just that hour or two hours or whatever is uh, really magical. It's, uh, I'm lucky that, you know, since a child, I've been able to do that very, very easily very, very easily. I don't, I didn't, I've never needed a process to get me there. I've just, through my meditation, I can just get into, into that really happily and very effortlessly. So, yeah, so when I come to the table, I come to the table, first of all, you know, or when I come to making a design, I come to there representing Mother Nature, because that's my first client, and that's who inspires me, that's who um, I'm there representing. Um, that's probably the best, 
best anecdote I can give you in terms of how I can try to get people to feel that same that same sense of awe when you become another insect or another animal. When we do our forest gardening courses, I do the same thing, is I get everyone to pretend, all right, so you're a strawberry, you're a peach tree, you're an apple tree, you're a, you know, this, that, and the other. All right, where do you want to be? All right, if I put you there, how do you feel? All right, so now I've just put this uh, big uh, walnut tree in front of this uh, apple tree uh, to the south side of it. How, how do you feel, apple tree? You know, when the sun comes up, who's going to be the sun? Yeah, walk across. Yeah, how, are you, how do you feel? Uh, so what are you going to do? No, no, you can't walk. You're a tree. You're planted. Stay there. So you're going to struggle. So not a good situation. So I get them to feel and imagine what it's like to be nature. And, and that's how I design. That's how I, that's how I teach. That's how I show people how to, how to understand nature. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So empathy. Mm. Talk a lot about empathy between human beings, those of us who uh, do nonviolent communication or other or those kinds of forms of, of connecting across people, and to then include the rest of the world besides people in that. Mm-hmm. Empathy. Yeah. I had a, a, a completely different frame of question going to the detail, uh, wondering. In your in the two day in the in the course where you start with sociocracy, what do you actually do in sort of in more detail? How do you actually do the teaching or the sharing or the involvement uh, of you know in sociocracy in that very beginning? And what do you actually do uh, in the checking in of how is this going for us? You know, what's that? Sorry, for for which course? For for like a long permaculture design course? Yeah. Okay. You say you start off with sociocracy. What does that mean in, in more detail of what you actually do? How do you walk through that? Okay, cool. Yeah, so if we're talking about like a long-term, like a 14-day course or a 10-day course or something, so I'll start by getting people to think about why they're there. Why is it you've come to this workshop? What is it? So I ask them, and I mix in a little bit of dragon dreaming, dreaming circle kind of terminology, and I'll say, well, what needs to happen over the next 10 days, two weeks, whatever, however long it's for, what needs to happen over these next uh, two weeks that's going to make you passionately walk away saying, this was the most amazing two weeks of my life. What needs to happen? What, you know, what tangible things do you want to happen here that's going to make you walk away and tell all your friends, wow, that was just so incredible. And I give them time and I get them to talk about it in little groups, in maybe twos. First, maybe think about it and write a few ideas down themselves, then get it to talk to each other in in pairs um, so that they flesh out some of these ideas, then get them to talk about it in a slightly larger group and then uh, synthesize the real key things. Um, And that gets done, you know, in such a way that we start recording uh, and again, using this kind of dragon dreaming type process with a talking stick, everyone gets an opportunity to add something and we check in. Has it already been said? If it's already been said, no need to say it again. So add something new, but only add something if it's really essential. So keep it clear, keep it neat, but keep it really relevant as something that's really going to excite you. So we then synthesize that. We go through a process where we synthesize it to create a clear vision. And quite often, you know, some of the things that people say are very clearly mission statements. And some are, we can, and we can also extract a few buzzwords, which then creates uh, a vision. So we create the vision. We then check uh, these vision statements that, or these mission statements that we've kind of highlighted. Do they actually help us? To achieve this vision or no and, and what's missing what else is missing so um so this way we kind of you know merge and we play and we tweak and we kind of eventually get to a clear vision of why we are together you know, why are you here for this workshop as well as a mission statement as to how we're going to get there what's the strategy we're going to take to actually achieve this and then as part of that then comes like the course culture you know so how is it that we communicate do we use nonviolent communication for example do we um 
you know, how is it that we make, you know, so one of my needs as a facilitator of learning is, uh, is I've got a lot of material that I would love to get through. But if we consistently keep starting uh, late and ending late, a, you know, I'm going to get frustrated. Uh, I'm not going to be so happy constantly teaching people who drip in and out and blah, blah, blah. So I've got certain needs. Uh, so, yeah, so we make agreements. How do we deal with that? I just start when I say I'm going to start. Anyone who's not here, it's your responsibility. So is everyone okay with that? Is everyone, does everyone consent to that? And, and so, so bit by bit, we create this culture of how we're going to operate, how we're going to work. And into that, we then evolve, okay, well, how do we deal with emotional issues? How do we deal with this? How do we deal with that? So all this kind of stuff we start to discuss at the beginning. And the most important things that are pressing for people at the beginning is what we identify, knowing that this list is just good enough for now, safe enough to try. It's not perfect. The vision is not perfect. The mission is not perfect. It's just, is it good enough for today to get us through the next two, three days? If it is, let's go. And then through the process, we keep tweaking it. Ah, oh, this is missing. That's missing. Oh, we never thought of that. And we keep tweaking it, adding to it, um, tweaking it and making it, you know, more and more appropriate. Oh, this, people are still late. All right, what are we going to do? Why is it that, you know, no one can turn up on time? What's going on here? All right, so what do we need to do to, to adjust this? And so we keep tweaking it, adjusting it until everything starts to run nice and smoothly. Is that? Yeah. So in the ongoing process, maybe you've said this before, you have like a community meeting mm -hmm. to review how, how we are all working together. Uh, and if there's anything that, that needs attention. Exactly. So I've, I've done it different ways but the way that I'm using right now and again I'm always open to changing and experimenting and but at the end of each day we have um, a group meeting so let's say if there's 20 people uh, we'll have maybe five groups of four and then all the teachers we have our own uh, meeting as well and in that uh, we give people the opportunity to review the day to understand and now, if there's anything you didn't understand, now's a chance to check in and see if you can understand. Uh, then, um, but what's not working for you? If there's anything, you know, that uh, isn't really serving you and really allowing you to thrive in this workshop during this our time together, express it. If the group themselves can solve it, so for example, uh, I know I'm just too cold, I need another blanket at night or something, and yeah, I've got an extra blanket, there you go, solved, then it doesn't need to come to the whole group. Whereas if it's something larger that the whole group needs to hear, for example, um, yeah, I'm sleeping in a tent and, you know, uh, and I want to be in bed by 10, 11 o'clock, whatever, but there's people having parties and, you know, singing and drinking and da la la la, making a lot of noise right outside my tent till two, three o'clock in the morning. Now, that then comes back to the whole group and the whole group then tries to create a proposal that meets that person's need to be able to sleep. You know, so in this way, you know, also maybe, I don't know, uh, another example could be that uh, maybe they're just not getting enough rest. Maybe the, the you know, there's not enough, long enough breaks. Maybe, uh, maybe the food isn't, you know, uh, meeting their need for some reason, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, a really good, real practical um, anecdote I can give you is I was doing one course. It's probably one of the most uh, difficult courses to get off the ground, but turned out to be probably one of the most amazing courses by the end. We turned up at this place in, in Bulgaria. Uh, the venue itself, we had to change at the last minute because there's a big flood. And so we couldn't even get access to the eco village. So they hired this, uh, this venue just down the hill, which turned out to be a hunting lodge. So as soon as we move in, there's all these dead pigs heads and this, that, and the other a big, huge, a three of oh, a huge, I don't know, a zero photo of a severed pig's head. There were guns, there was, I mean, it was like, wow, where have we walked into? So we started cleaning it, we changed the energy of the place. And then uh, all of a sudden, the electricity died. Oh, 
So we found the guy. He said, oh, have they done that already? I thought they were going to... I didn't think they'd cut me off for at least another couple of weeks. Sorry about that. <laughs> he basically didn't pay the bills. And then the next day, all the water ran out. He said, oh, ah, oh, yeah. Someone told me there might be a crack in the tank. Uh, don't worry, I'll fill it up. But as soon as it runs out, um, you know, I'll... Yeah, you have to pay for it the next time. So basically, we had no electricity. He basically gave us a generator. Um, we had no water and we had no sunshine. It was October in uh, Bulgaria. And, and the hosts were saying, don't worry, we'll go and buy this, we'll go and buy that. We'll... I said, no, don't do anything. Let the people come. 27 students we had, you know, the largest group I've ever had. I never teach more than 20, but for some reason uh, we ended up with 27. And uh, I said, let them come, let them solve it. So one by one, okay, no problem. We'll do this, we'll do that. We'll get water from there. We'll do this, we'll do that. Da, da, da. Okay, you don't need a shower for at least three days. And everything got solved. And, um, and that really brought about a real amazing spirit. Now, three people spoke no English whatsoever in this course, including one guy who was a, a military man. So, uh, and he just retired from the army and now he fixes guns for a living. And he was on the course, didn't speak a word of English. And at the end of the course, when he gave his feedback, it was really amazing. He said, um, he said, after two days, I just wanted to leave. He said, uh, the translation was terrible. He said, uh, half of things were being translated, half of it just wasn't being translated. You guys were laughing so much. Not one joke was ever translated. I had no clue why you were constantly laughing. Then he said, and then I saw guys hugging guys. He said, that's it, I'm off. No, I'm not in this, no, this is too freaky for me. But through the process of this guild meeting, trying to understand his needs, we got caught wind of the, of the translation issues. So we kept tweaking it, changing it, tweaking it, tweaking it, tweaking it. And you saw around day four, even though it wasn't his duty, at five o'clock every morning, as soon as the sun uh, was just about to rise, he'd go off into the forest, he'd go and collect all these wild foods, and he'd just bring it back to start making breakfast for everybody. It wasn't his duty to do that. He'd just done it out of the love for doing it. And what he said at the end of the course, he said, you guys have shown me so much love. He said, I have never felt this much love ever in my life. He said, why do we have to go? Give me a passport so I'm going to burn them, throw them away. We should stay here for the rest of our lives like this together forever. You know, and uh, in that final round of feedback, most people were in tears. Most people were in tears out of the absolute, you know, out of this sense of, um, you know, the fact that they know they felt so much love and now it's about to end. They're all about to go home and we'll never see each other again in this same way. Because for many, it was such a deep experience for them. Um, I mean, there was so much laughter, so much love, so much... Uh, because of this constant feedback, because of this constant checking in with each other, how are you doing? How's everything going? How, what, what's not serving you? So the process works. The process is really beautiful. It really brings people together. I don't Hello. know if that answers. No. I've yeah. forgotten the question actually. Yeah. So oh, no. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea if it's answered anything. it or not. <laughs> Love means your needs matter. Mm -hmm. So we want to open it up to the questions uh, from audience here, and we've got some in the chat already. Uh, I'll read one. Or Jennifer, you want to? Yeah, for everybody who might be on a on a device that doesn't show the chat, um, yes, we've we've opened it up for questions. So one of them is: any ideas for what to do with persistent objections or chronic objectors? Okay. Ah, I don't get them. <laughs> I use logic. I use logic to, uh, you know, to say, okay, uh, this is our vision and our mission that we have all agreed to. Um, so you've elected me as a facilitator. 
here's my role description that you have created for me. My role is to get us to the end of this meeting using the best possible tools in the most sincere way to meet your needs. I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you and to do the job that you have asked me to do. And, uh, and so when someone starts speaking out of line, when someone starts behaving in a way that is not coherent with the culture that we have created, I'll pull them up. Part of my role description is to be firm but fair. So when someone starts, when I say, right, I need a quick reaction, that's one, two, three words or a noise. If someone starts going on into a sentence, thank you very much, next person. Because that's what you have elected me to do. I'm not here as a dictator who's trying to dictate terms. You have very clearly given me a role description. The other thing I do is I ask people to do um, uh, what James would call artful participation, what I would call heartful participation, which is, um, you know, so half of the skill of the facilitator getting a group to the end is the tool bag that they have, the, the tools that they have as a facilitator. But the other half is in the ability for those who are participating to artfully participate. If you don't respect the rules that we have created for ourselves, that we have created for ourselves, let's restate that. If you don't respect those, you're making it almost impossible for me to do the job that you have asked me to do. So I just throw logic back at them and say, well, this is why I'm here. Uh, and if there's a, um, so explain to me exactly why that's an objection. Okay, in my opinion, that's not an objection because if that happens, because what you're saying perhaps is, uh, that's an opinion of how to do it better. That's not what I'm looking for right now. If you want to make another proposal of how we make it better, that's fine, wonderful. There's a process how you do that. But right now, we're just checking, is there any logical, rational reason as to why if we do this, it will stop us from getting to our end goal, stop us meeting our vision and mission? Answer that first, and then we'll look at, uh, if you want to improve on that, we'll look at that as a later process. But right now, this is the proposal that's in front of us. I just want to check if this is good enough for now, safe enough to try. So um, once we get to the point where everyone really feels that vision and mission, really, really feels that we are coming together. We're doing this because we collectively want to move as a group, to use a, a, a Sanskrit word, this samaj, this movement of people together, this passionate group of people moving together. Once we feel that, if someone is trying to pull you in a different direction, it really becomes obvious. Perhaps you're not actually right for this project. We're all pulling in one direction. For some reason, you're pulling in a different direction. Do you actually want to be on this train or do you want to be on a different path? Yes, uh, luckily, I very rarely encounter that because once people truly feel the vision, what I found is I found, for example, people who are uh, very dominant and pretty much take over meetings right from the beginning. When I ask them, and, and this is one of the ways in which I actually start sociocracy courses, I get people to... Um, to just have an ordinary meeting. So look, if you know anything about sociocracy, don't use it. If you know anything about any collaborative decision-making tools, don't use them. Just go back into your old mode of how you used to make decisions before, just that so we can experiment. And I get them to do something really mundane. And sure enough, someone totally takes over. So you see all these stereotypes kicking in, you know, maybe three, four people having a passionate debate and everyone else completely silent. Um, and I say, okay, stop. Now let's explore those roles. And the first person I ask is this person who took the lead. Why did you take the lead? Well, it's because you told us we've only got 15 minutes to make this decision. I looked around, no one else was offering, but I know I've got those skills to do it. 
And I want us to get to that end goal to help us make. So you did it for the right reasons. You did it because you want to help the group to get to an end goal. Um, that's the first thing to recognize. And, you know, and so we carry on looking at the different archetypes, looking at, you know, why the people didn't speak up, looking at why, you know, um, and, and basically we uncover that actually the people who really take over are not necessarily dictators. They're doing it for a reason. And so if, once you actually give them a framework where they don't need to take that role because you can trust everybody, anybody who is going to make a decision and facilitate making a decision, if you can trust that that group has, the decision that they've made is good enough for now and safe enough to try, it will never compromise your project. If you can trust that, there's no need for you to step in. There's no need for you as the, as the one who always tries to step in and take over. There's no need for you to do that. And all of a sudden, the look on their face is like, wow, what a relief. Because I don't like taking this role. I don't want to be a dictator. So it's really interesting. So, yeah, so, so it's very rare that I, I come across uh, people who really are genuinely troublemakers, people who really genuinely consistently keep blocking things for no rational reason if they've got a good solid logical rational reason great i need to hear it we need to hear it but if it's just in order to express your opinion thank you very much there's another time for that there's another place for that hold that thought write it down even we'll hear it at another point when it's appropriate Okay, um, we've got a few more questions here. And Ariana, if you want to unmute yourself and ask directly. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, Rakesh, this is great. Um, so this is maybe a little bit dull for some of you because I'm going to go a bit detailed because I'm actually, as you heard in my intro, I'm actually teaching on an EDE right now. And I've been on the edge of wanting because it's four weeks. It's such an amazing opportunity to teach people sociocracy. So last year I did do it a little bit, um, having you know design teams use it for consenting to their team agreements. And I'm doing that again tomorrow. But my question is, is when you convene a PDC or you know a course and you're starting sociocratically, I may have missed it, but is there an assumption that you are the you are the facilitator because people have responded to your convening of the course and that's why you do you see what i mean is like how yeah, do you know that role of facilitator in the first place no i you're absolutely right i totally get their permission to facilitate so and this works it doesn't matter what i'm doing so for example if i'm starting a new project a new transition group or something um when i convene a meeting i'll say um Okay, so we're here together. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, does anyone mind if we have a meeting where we start on time, where we end on time, where every single agenda point gets addressed, where everyone's voice is heard and so on and so forth. And you know, I go through a little list. Does anyone object if we have a meeting like that? And everyone's looking like, that's not possible. I've never had a meeting <laughs> like that ever in my life. What are you talking about? Um, Okay, but if, if we could find a way, does anyone object if we have that type of meeting today? And people say, no, of course not. So I ask each person individually, any objections? No, no objections? Okay, great. So how do we get there? So what we need is, A, we need a group of, or we need a facilitator or a group of facilitators who have a way in which they can do that. Is there anyone here who has those skills? No? Okay, well, I can. Um, it's, it's what I actually enjoy doing. So, so any objections if I try to facilitate this meeting today, just for today? Um, and then, you know, test for consent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, no objections. Thank you very much. All right. So in order to help me um, facilitate this process, what I need is for you to artfully or heartfully participate. Then I'll explain what artful participation is. And check again. Any objections to you artfully participating? No? Okay, great. Now we're ready to go. So in a workshop, I do more or less the same. 
I'll, uh, I'll explain. Okay, so this is our vision and mission. This is where we want to get to. Um, this is what we all want to do. So in order to get there, we need several things. We need someone who can facilitate learning. Um, is there anyone here who can teach permaculture? You can teach socioxy? Well, I can. Um, so any objections if I, I facilitate? Is there any reason, logical, rational reason as to why if I was to facilitate the learning process, that it would get in the way of meeting our vision and mission? No, 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 no. Okay, no objections, great. So now I've got their permission to facilitate. And again, I go through the artful participation and, and all the rest of it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and some people say that, well, why did you bother doing that? I mean, we paid to come on a course because you're teaching it. And so of course you're gonna teach it. I said, yeah, but now I've got complete permission. Now I've got your absolute 100% recordable permission to actually use the best possible tools that I can think of to facilitate the process of you learning. And you have artfully, and in, or rather you have also uh, consented to artfully participate, which includes uh, feeding back to me when things are not working for you. When something isn't working, if you're not understanding my language, for example, you have consented to feed that back to me so that I can adjust to help do what you have just asked me to do, which is facilitate the learning process. And if I see you as an individual have more knowledge on a subject than I do, it's my role as the facilitator of learning to invite you in to actually do the teaching instead of me. If you know something better than me, why, why am I, I'm not, you know, so egotistical that I need to stand up here all day and talk. I want to get you in to explain that and express that. So this is the process. And um, yeah, yeah. I th but I think you know that already, don't you? Yeah, and I, so that was very helpful. And I've got one other little question with your, when you get people into the small groups at the end of the day, are mm -hmm. they, so, um, are, are they in design teams or are they in more no. like a home group? You mentioned they were guilds, but how does that form? Um, sometimes it's done logically. Sometimes it's done randomly. And, but, but basically it's not in design groups for sure. Right. So it's and just a, you want a kind of a separate space for people to yeah, be in a different vibe than being in a design group. Exactly. And part of the, the um, proposal forming exercise that gets to design that tool, that, that team, uh, we look at, is there any logical, is, is there any, what are the boundaries? So people ask the questions. So for example, if there's several people who don't speak English, um, you know, do we need to have someone who's a very, very good English speaker in each group, right. for example, who can translate into the local language? Uh, other areas, for example, the other thing that each group does is they cook together. I never, ever, ever get anyone else to ever cook for us on a course because that cooking process is, you know, that, uh, that understanding of each other. Oh, this person eats this. That person is allergic to that. How do we cook something that takes care of everyone here? And that process of lovingly creating some food and serving it to each other with love is an absolutely essential part of the course. Mm. And um, so perhaps one of the questions is, is there someone in each group, do we need someone in each group who knows how to cook for 20 people? Right. You know? Um, yeah. So yeah, so, so sometimes it's completely random, but sometimes we actually use more logic to actually form, you know, and then we kind of, dots on people of you know who can and we make sure that we've got someone who is a good cook someone who can speak uh the local language and english well and etc etc um so we make sure that the group is balanced and then sometimes we look at gender equality you know if there there's one group that's all male and another group who's all female or something we try and juggle things around and and what have you so we make sure there's more balance Great, thank you so much. I'm, I'm gonna step back because there's loads of other questions, but I'm really enjoying what you're saying. So brilliant, Pleasure. thanks. Yeah, I'd love to come up to Fintorn one day.
Mm. Oh yeah. Weather. Well, I'll have to sort that out. Yeah, it'd be lovely. All right, I was well, just up in uh, Scotland just a few weeks ago, but not that far north. Though. Right. I'd like to oh, go to one last question in the formal webinar and, um, and then close so that releases people to go. And then anybody who wants to hang out more informally, we can still stay here and talk some more. Um, and the last question is, um, so any suggestions for resources or ways to learn more about permaculture and social permaculture? Hmm. Um, the only book that I know of is uh, Luby McNamara's book. Um, I've forgotten the name of it. People, People and Permaculture. Perm People and Permaculture, thank you. Um, that's the only resource that I can, I'm, I'm really not a good person for reading. Um, <laughs> so there are probably lots of really good internet resources that I have no clue about. Uh, obviously, I'm going to say, you know, come to one of my workshops. That's the, <laughs> um, because, you know, Pretty much the reason why I do 14 days of PDC is so that I can uh, get the social aspect of permaculture really deeply embedded in people. And so I've got lots of flexibility to really play around with, with the whole social structures. And then the, um, the community building experience is the other, is the really, I mean, that's pretty much like an EDE. It's like an eco village design education course, but put into practice. So where every day you're checking in with each other, you're doing the forum, you're doing, you know, everyone's going on their hero's journeys. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're putting sociocracy and everything into practice every single day. And we've even created a tool called the bell analysis tool where everyone at, we all, we all analyze, you know, What's the level of bonding that we feel? What's the level of education we're getting? And um, what's the level of learning we're getting? So everyone maps those out. And each week we look at what's shifting that, what's changing, you know? So we can see, I don't know how much people are familiar with the whole uh, forming, storming, norming, performing, uh, forming, storming, norming, performing, transforming uh, pattern. But, uh, but we see, you know, how, for example, maybe the bonding and the learning are very, very different up until this stage of the, 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 the crash and the storm. And then bang, after that, everything comes together. And, and so we really analyze all these different human dynamics. So, um, so in terms of other resources, I really, I'm not really the best person to ask, I'm afraid. Uh, most of the tools that I've discovered are when someone has shown me something then i've adapted it um or if or many of them i've just made up myself so um yeah but in terms of resources i'm really sorry i'm not the best person all right so let's we want to bring this to a close we'll say that um we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this webinar uh, with a link to the recording so you can watch it again if you'd like and share it, and share it with others. Uh, that email will also give you some information about a couple of other previous webinars we've done that connect sociocracy and permaculture. Uh, and of course, we'll say something about sociocracy for all and how you can connect more with sociocracy for all and our programs. Uh, so at this point, if everybody would unmute, and you can, oh, we can unmute everybody. Oh, we can mute everybody, perhaps, and we'll wave. We'll wave everybody and mute all. We can the children can say things too. Uh, and after we wave, we'll let people go who want to go, and we'll hang out. Oh, this is us. Awesome. I'd already did. All right. So formal close. Thank, Thank you all. You all.